He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, ko William Rayaho. Welcome to Black Sheep. June 1865. Titoa Hanatoa is riding his horse along a track near the bank of the Tangahoe River in Taranaki. That river marks the front line of a war zone. Tito is a rangatira, a Ngāti Nui chief, and over the last five years, his iwi have been in an on-again, off-again war with the colonial government. He's on a scouting mission, trying to spy on a nearby camp housing the British Army's 57th Regiment of Foot. He's still on the far side of the river from that camp when he spots a flash of red on the track ahead of him. It's a soldier. His uniform is dripping wet. He puts up his hands to show he's unarmed. Tito Hanatoa shouts at him in a mix of te reo and English. Hey, you, Pākehā! Go back, quick! Hurry out to! Hurry out to! Go away, back to the soldiers! I shoot you, you suppose you no go! Hook you to! Shoot away, I won't go back. I'm running away from the soldiers. I, I want to go to the Maoris, take me with you. You dangata kuare, you Pākehā fool, go back! The Māori kill you, my word! You look out. Uh, I don't care if they do. I, I tell you, I want to live with the how house. Eh, Poyana. All right, you come along. But you look out for my tribe. They kill you. I'm not frightened of your tribe. What's your name, Parker, huh? Kimball Bent. <laughs> This story is a part of the New Zealand wars which often gets forgotten. Most of us know there were plenty of Māori who allied themselves with the British, the so-called kūpapa Māori, but what's less well known is there were a handful of Europeans who went the other way, who abandoned the British forces and went to live among Māori. To the European colonists, these people were traitors of the very worst kind. There were bounties on their heads. They were wanted, dead or alive. We know very little about most of these people, these Pākehā Māori as they were sometimes called, but Kimball Bent is different. Kimball Bent survived the war and decades later as an old man He told the story to the historian James Cowan, who turned it into a book, The Adventures of Kimball Bent. I've already quoted a bit of that book and that exchange between Kimball Bent and Tito Hanatoa. It's a story that's been retold over the years. The version you might be most familiar with is Morris Shadbolt's novel, Monday's Warriors. I've actually got that book here in front of me. I'll just read you a bit from the opening chapter. It was the year that a distinguished British general, seldom menaced by more than a hundred warriors, took ten and bittering weeks to march four regiments just sixty New Zealand miles, and at last found a war worth leaving unwon. It was the year before his substitute, no martial novice either, likewise learned that glory was the lesser part of an Antipodean crusade. He magically managed to lose most of an army to belligerent ravines and insurgent vegetation without engaging his enemy. Between one luckless general and the next, there's a fleck of fable in history's eye called Kimball Bent, a son of Sodom Docks, Eastport, State of Maine. A fleck of fable in history's eye. It's a nice way of describing Kimball Bent, although there are other words you could use. But his track record as a bit of a bullshitter and a troublemaker when he was younger stood him in good stead as a mature survivalist. I don't know how he sat between the cracks of the Pākehā world and the Māori world, but he managed to... In, uh, instinctively zigzag through it and survive. This is Chris Grosh. He's a cartoonist and illustrator who wrote a graphic novel about Kimball Bent. You can find some images from that novel on our website. Kimball Bent's survival story begins in the seaside city of Eastport, Maine, in the United States. He was born on the 24th of August, 1837. His father was a shipbuilder. He said his mother was Native American. Bent ran away to sea when he was about 17. Uh, He joined the U.S. Navy and travelled up and down the Atlantic seaboard for about, I think, three years. Uh, He was a cadet training as a sailor gunner. Uh, Then he returned to Eastport, became bored and decided to set sail for England. I think his father slipped him a quid or two to be able to do that. 
but very soon after arriving in England, Bent frittered away all the money his father had given him on booze and fancy clothes. He ended up stranded with no way to pay for a place on a ship back to the USA. One evening in 1860, he was drowning his sorrows in a pub when the fancy uniform of a British Army recruiter caught his eye. He got talking with the recruiter and ended up drunkenly enlisting with the 57th Regiment of Foot. It turned out to be the worst decision of his life. Apparently the discipline and parade ground drilling was uh, a far cry from the rather more relaxed US Navy way of doing things. Floggings were um, common. Uh, The discipline was pretty heavy. Bent soon decided to desert. Uh, When he did desert, he managed to stow away on a a sort of a coal transporter, I think, bound for Boston, uh, which founded and and had to come back. Uh, He ended up in Glasgow. He was spotted and picked up as a deserter, court-martialed and thrown into jail for 84 days. Now, 84 days, a hell of a long time. And it would have been real, like, real tough. It would have been uh, hard labour. It would have been bread and water, as they say. Uh, they would have treated him pretty toughly, I would have thought. It wasn't Bent's last run-in with British Army discipline. One of the sergeants of the 57th Regiment said he was, quote, repeatedly punished for acts of petty thievery and drunkenness. At first, Bent was deployed to India, but after two years, the 57th was sent to New Zealand, part of the British response to what we now call the Taranaki Wars. I'm not going to go too much into the detail of what caused those wars. The super short version is that they were started after a land dispute spiralled into a series of bitter conflicts between Taranaki Māori and the colonial government. There was also a religious angle to these wars. Many Taranaki hapu converted to a new religion called Pai Māori De, which combined aspects of Christianity with older Māori traditions. People who followed the Pai Māori De religion, commonly known as Ho-Ho, were violent anti-European fanatics, at least in the eyes of the European authorities. I don't believe that for an instant. Um, Pai Māori is a faith at the end of the day. It's the haki of the people. This is Tihi Daisy Noble. She was the lead treaty negotiator for Ngāti Ruahine, and as part of that job, she did extensive research into the Taranaki Wars. I asked her why Europeans were so afraid of Paimari there. It was a faith that was totally foreign to them, and it was something that they couldn't get into because it wasn't done in English real, it was done all in te reo Māori. And on that basis, if you don't understand the real of the day that they're speaking, it's totally foreign and it's like, based on the emotions and those sorts of things, it's almost like, oh, that's not something that we want to get involved in. It's sort of like when you go to any sort of faith that you don't understand, like if you go into a mosque and you don't understand the Muslim faith, then it can, you know, it's confusing. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you see all that practice going on in the mosque and you think to yourself, oh, that man was really strong in his words and it's almost like, what was he saying to yeah. us? And that's why the Pai Māori faith, in my view, was such a threat to the the settlers of the time. Mm. And they used that as part of the reasons why Māori were the way they were. It's because they had all these gods dancing around. But in actual fact, it was because they did not understand the language. Of course, Kimball Bent didn't really understand the political religious forces underpinning these wars. He didn't have an overview about all the things that we know now about what went on. He was just working day to day and dealing with what was happening right in front of him. So, yes, in that way, I don't think he knew a hell of a lot about the um, the politics or the, uh, the machinations of how all this stuff was um, brought about. There must have been all sorts of scary stories going around Bent's army barracks about these savage Māori warriors out in the bush. But as far as Bent was concerned, the savagery he got from his own side was the more immediate threat. It was really raining quite hard one particular evening, and a really vindictive corporal ordered him to go and cut wood during a rainstorm, and he just said... No, he refused and was subsequently arrested and brought before a court-martial, sentenced to a flogging of 50 lashes. Now that's... uh, Kimball Bent, from my understanding, wasn't a very big guy. He was quite slight. And uh, 50 lashes would have just... It would have killed him, I'm sure of that. 
Luckily for Bent, the camp doctor agreed he was physically incapable of withstanding the full 50 and the sentence was cut down to 25 lashes. He was also sentenced to prison time. On the day of the flogging, a friendly Canadian-born officer gave Bent a sixpence to bite on and a flask of whiskey to dull the pain. Then he was marched out in front of his regiment and tied to a wooden triangle. As I've already mentioned, historian James Cowan interviewed Kimball Bent about his life story. He wrote this about what happened next. The big drummer of the company stepped to the front. He was the flagellant. Bent bit on his substitute for the bullet as the cat swished through the air and fell like a red-hot knife against his quivering back. Again and again came the frightful cuts, crisscrossing upon his back and shoulders till the tale of twenty-five was complete. Then the prisoner was cast loose, swearing in his pain and passion to have the drummer's life. A blanket was thrown across his roar and bleeding shoulders, and he was marched back to the guard tent where the surgeon prescribed for him to a rough and ready fashion. Then to prison. He refused to go into the camp hospital. After a few months in prison, Kimball Bent returned to camp. It's during these months he made up his mind. He told his campmates that, Can't be worse off with the Maoris than I am here. <sighs> if they do tomahawk me, it'll, it'll be the end of all my troubles. I don't very much care. And so, on June 12th, 1865, he pretended to leave the camp to wash, swam across the river, and met his very first Taranaki Māori, the Ngāti Ruanui Rangatira, Tito Hanatoa. That was his first meeting, and they took him back to uh, the village, uh, Koyanga, and... Uh, He went through a pretty serious cross-examination by the tribal elders and various people as to why he crossed over. And he basically took his shirt off and revealed the scars on his back. And that convinced them that, you know, he was probably genuine about changing sides. So I don't know. The other thing to remember is, and I, I often think about this, is he was part Native American himself. So somewhere in his makeup or his genes is this tribal thing which maybe he felt comfortable in a in the structure of a, a tribal situation. Maybe he just didn't have the same sort of, you know, aversion towards um, a tribal society which most people, most, you know, European people sure. would have had. And he clearly wasn't racist because, uh, you know, he, this is his, uh, a life for the future. He decided just that's it, I'm going to become a ho-ho. In some ways, Bent was very lucky. The founder of the Paimari Re Faith, Te Ua Haumini, had told his followers that if any Pākehā deserted, they should be cared for and given protection. This alone probably demonstrates that the European view of the Ho-Ho as bloodthirsty fanatics was a little overhyped. But that didn't mean that Bent was going to find life easy living among Taranaki Māori. In the early days when he first met them, they kind of gave him menial tasks like, you know, clearing scrub, cutting wood, chopping down trees. And uh, over time, trust was established and he was given a mat and a blanket and two meals a day. So that was the early days of his slowly sort of um, becoming part of the, the, the iwi. He seems to be like he's sort of a slave-ish, but kind of like a, a valuable slave who, you, who you'd sort of... Yes, the only reason he lasted was because of some of his skills. He was a slave, but he had this ability to um, make uh, ammunition. Uh, he became an armourer, and what they did was... Uh, during battles, of course, they captured a lot of the uh, British... Uh, Weaponry, and he would take, for instance, their grenades and empty all the powder out of them, and turn them into uh, into bullets with a twist of paper, and and in fact, sometimes uh, when they ran out of lead, they would use things like peach kernels and hardwood and stones. So um, uh, there's quite often mentioned in some of the research that I've done that when a soldier was shot, sometimes he couldn't understand why he hadn't been killed, but he had a huge bruise. So. <laughs> This is the uh, way that um, Bent sort of made himself uh, invaluable. Eventually, Bent built up enough trust that he was married to a Māori woman. 
that he wasn't exactly thrilled with the match that was made for him. It was basically, take this woman or we'll kill you, which was um, uh, apparently quite an ugly, one-eyed woman who... uh, He he definitely uh, didn't seem attracted to her in the way that he describes her. Not really, but he didn't have a choice. He was given a foray to live in, and uh, and that was that. But, um, yes, his his value seemed to increase somewhat, and and the various uh, Paramount chiefs would put a tapu on him and say, he's my... My white man, my Pakia, and you can't touch him, you can't attack him, he's under my uh, mentorship or whatever. Daisy Noble thinks Māori leaders had good reason to take such a personal interest in Kimball Bent's well-being. The value for them would have been the colour of his skin to start with. This is Te Ua and Titoko's opportunity to find out how the Pakia thinks, how the Pakia works. It would be no different when our people were captured by the Pakia. They'd start exploring those minds to find out how, the, how we're thinking. He would have been the, viewed as the enemy regardless of what he finally, uh, he finally got to, what level he finally attained within the tribe. But at the end of the day, he was always useful. In January 1866, Bent got his first taste of the war from the other side. Ho-Ho scouts reported that Kimball Bent's old garrison were preparing for an attack. The target was Otopawa Pa, about eight kilometres east of where Hawara is today. Bent worked alongside the Māori to strengthen the Pa, reinforcing the palisades, digging new trenches, bringing up supplies of food and water. The attack finally came. James Cowan spoke to both British soldiers and Māori veterans about the battle. Here's how he described it. An Armstrong gun was brought to within a short distance of the hill fort and several shells were fired into the stockade. Then the general gave the order for the assault. As the Imperial soldiers, with bayonets fixed, doubled eagerly up the hill face to the front stockade, the Hau Hau chiefs, Tukino and Tuahipa, cried to their men, crouching in the outer trench with levelled guns, Sons, be steady and wait till they come close up, then let them have it. As the first files of the soldiers dashed up to the stockade, Puhia, fire, shouted the chiefs, and under the thundering volley, many whites fell. And then the soldiers were at the stockade, firing through the gaps in the obstruction and slashing at the ties of the fence. The Māori did not wait for the bayonet. The wild rush of the maddened troops was irresistible, leaving seven of their men killed in the trenches and about the palisades. The defenders gathered their wounded and fled. But it wasn't just Māori who suffered casualties from the Battle of Otopawa Pa. Eleven Pākehā were killed, including Kimball Bent's former commander. And when the British troops returned to camp, rumours were that Bent himself was the one who fired the fatal shot. Uh, Well, it was rumoured that Bent had shot and killed his 57th uh, Regiment Commanding Officer, Lieutenant Colonel Hazard, after the war... Um, and during an interview with with Cohen, he strongly denied this and saying that he'd been told by the prophet to take the old people and the women and the children uh, several miles away into the forest when, in fact, Hazard was killed. Um, Bent said he never fired a shot at his former comrades and the whole time he was with the ho-ho. And this was later confirmed by Maori warriors who were there saying that they would never trust a Pākehā with a gun because he might turn it on them. So consequently... Uh, it could be possible that he he didn't fire any shots against uh, his former uh, friends. But while he may never have fired a shot in support of the ho-ho, Ben had other roles in the war effort. We've already mentioned his work in making ammo, but he also helped treat the wounded. The woman taught Bent uh, natural remedies using plants and herbs and bark for healing wounds of the injured, especially after a battle. And though Bent had uh, attended many uh, like surgical procedures in his time in the army, so he'd seen uh, the way they did it and used some of that knowledge when possible. But um, the Maori preferred their own ointments themselves and the woman would boil up flax roots, for instance, and make a, a mucilage, like a, a jelly-like substance, which 
uh, they'd apply to gunshot and bayonet wounds, and it seemed to work very well. So, and this sort of these sort of skills he um, attained seems to be part of why he gets traded to a different chief, a guy called uh, Rupe. Rupe, who was uh, again a chief, told. Uh, Tito that he'd never had a Pākehā slave before and demanded that um, he hand him over as his personal helper. Well, Rupe, you know, he was pretty persuasive. And uh, when Rupe's son became very ill, bent uh, with his newfound natural healing abilities, managed to nurse him back to good health. And uh, as a reward, uh, Rupe presented him with his beautiful blue-eyed daughter, Rihi, and unlike his first wife, who left him for another man, Kimball Bent seems to have genuinely loved Rihi. He described her as beautiful and gentle, a girl about 16 years old. He told James Cowan he particularly admired the tattoo on her face and legs and even asked to be tattooed himself, although this was forbidden on the grounds that cutting his skin would violate the tapu which had been placed on him. Somewhat tragically, the child Bent and Rihi had together died in infancy, and shortly after that, Rihi herself died. We don't know how. Maybe it was a complication of childbirth. You might be thinking, it feels a bit like Bent has been totally accepted into Māori society, but it's not quite that simple. As you can probably imagine, a lot of Taranaki Māori felt a deep resentment towards Pākehā, and that anger was sometimes vented at Kimball Bent. Bent told Cowan about one particular incident involving an older Ngāti Maniapoto man who was a veteran of the Waikato Wars. This older Waikato warrior and Bent were sent on a food hunting expedition to find a wild pig honey and eels and bring it back to Kayanga. And after days of uh, hunting and sitting around the fire, Bent became very wary of this guy because he was an old, he was a Waikato guy and he was fully, fully tattooed. And uh, at night he used to have these uh, heated rants against Pākehā and do huckers around the fire and, uh, you know, anti-Pākehā rhetoric and... Uh, and how his northern tribe wanted Utu for some past event during the Waikato Wars. And uh, when he retired for the night on one particular evening, Bent kept one eye open and managed to prevent an attack by this angry warrior because he lunged at him uh, with an axe and tried to tomahawk him. But uh, apparently Bent wrestled the weapon from him and grabbed his leg, got him to the ground, and apparently he stayed awake all that night, forcing this antagonist to walk in front of him in the morning uh, back to the Kayanga. And when Rupe heard about this event, he chased the old man into the forest, who was never to return. Ben said this sort of thing happened quite a few times. Someone in the tribe would lose their cool about the war and would start threatening to kill Bent. One of his friends in the Kayanga would tip him off, so he'd go off and hide in the bush or hide in someone's house for a while until the heat died down. The fighting in Taranaki was sporadic. One war would end, only for the conflict to flare up again a few months or years later. The final major war began in 1868 and was led by a Māori prophet and war leader called Tito Kowaru. By this stage, Kimball Bent was actually one of several Pākehā deserters living with Taranaki Māori. One of the more interesting ones was an Irish guy called Charles Kane. Unlike Bent, Kane actually did take up arms against the Europeans. There's one account from a British soldier called John Beamish who was inside a fort when it was attacked by a group of Ho-Ho warriors. One after another, our men fell shot or badly wounded. I had very little hope of getting out of the place alive. My younger brother was fighting not far from me. He fell mortally wounded and before he died he told us he believed it was a white man who shot him. That white man who killed John Beamish's brother was Charles Kane. But after this battle, Kane changed sides for a second time and claimed that Kimball Bent was also willing to become a double agent and turn against Tito Kowaru. Kane was exposed as a traitor because he left a note beside a well-used path to the uh, Waihi Redoubt, trying to suggest that he and Bent uh, were waiting for an opportunity to bring in Titokuru's head in exchange for a pardon. 
and luckily for Bent, one of the Ho-Ho warriors who discovered the note could read English. Uh, Bent and Kane were brought before Te Tokuru, and Bent managed to convince him that Kane was lying and was an untrustworthy untrust- collaborator. Uh, Kane apparently was tracked down at a later date and killed, his remains being thrown into a disused Coomera pit. It's hard to understand why Charles Kane would lie about Bent being willing to turn against Titokowaru, but there's no real evidence to prove anything. He must have spun a pretty convincing story to avoid being killed himself. And Kimball Bent had an even more frightening experience in September 1868 after a battle at a pa known as Tinutu or Temanu. According to James Cowan, Kimball Bent actually helped build the pa. His job was to help uh, with the palisades and making uh, screens built up of bush and saplings. And also they had um, hollow trees would have a ports in them where you could put a gun through to shoot. And I actually went down to the, the actual battleground and there is a tree still there with a port in it. And they made um, tree huts and platforms up in the trees, which is why that uh, in the early part of that battle that um, the colonials lost so many men because they didn't realise that um, they were up in the trees and in these hollowed out trees as well. And they had uh, they'd worked out ways of uh, infilading where they, when they come up through the various obvious paths that these uh, guns were all lined up to take anyone out. So... Uh, Ben um, was involved in the preparation of some of that. These preparations turned out to be absolutely critical. There were barely 60 Taranaki warriors defending the pa against a government force five times the size. But the confusion of bullets flying out from holes and trunks and down from the tree huts, along with some really bad leadership on the European side, together proved devastating. 24 Europeans were killed, 26 wounded, with virtually no losses on the Ho-Ho side. Among the dead was the famous mercenary Julius von Tempsky, who really should get his own episode of Black Sheep one day. Kimball Bent wasn't at the Battle of Tenutu or Temanu. Just like in the previous battle, he was sent away with the women, old men and children, but he was there to see what happened afterwards. Bent was put into a, a foray out of the way and he he saw through a, like a crack in the wall that um, basically the troops that had been killed, the, the Pakeha troops, were laid out on the ground and stripped and all of their um, belongings, uh, you know, hats, uh, um, tobacco, personal effects, um, ammunition pouches and weapons were sort of laid out for, to be divvied up amongst everybody and including... The bodies. Kimball Bent said he saw one of the bodies taken away. The rest were cremated in a large fire. Here's his account of what happened next. Just a warning, this is fairly graphic, so feel free to skip ahead. I presently went down to the cooking quarters to see what had become of the body that had been dragged away. There I found a large earth oven full of red-hot stones, and there they were engaged in roasting the white man's corpse. They had prepared it for cooking in the usual way and were turning it over and over on the hot stones, scraping off the outer skin. The cannibal cooks looked round and asked me savagely what I wanted there. They threatened that if I did not leave instantly, they would throw me into the oven too and roast me alive. I returned to the marae and was sitting amongst the crowd there some time later, perhaps an hour, when I saw a man's hand and ribs cooked, carried up. The cannibalism of colonial soldiers by Taranaki Māori totally scandalised the British forces. At the time, the Pākehā authorities said it was evidence the Ho-Ho were lapsing into barbarism under the influence of their deluded prophets. One of those prophets, the famous war leader Te Tokawaru, wrote this threatening letter to the government. I have begun to eat the flesh of the white man. I have eaten him like the flesh of the cow, cooked in the pot. All have eaten him, even the women and the children. My throat is continually open for the eating of human flesh by day and by night. 
Now, accounts from all other sources contradict that letter. It's universally accepted that Tito Kawaru himself never ate human flesh. So why send a letter claiming that he did? Well, modern historians like James Balich think threats like these, along with actual instances of cannibalism, had a dual purpose, provocation and intimidation. Is it a scaring tactic? I would say that if it was used in that sense, then it can be very successful. I mean, if you're going to get shot and killed, you get shot and killed, but God forbid there's somebody that's going to catch you and eat you. You know, that, that, that brings on a whole different dynamic. Mm. Um, in terms of things, in terms of us adopting that practice, there would be have to be a purpose as to why we do it. Mm. Well, um, I yeah. almost thought the more interesting part of what Balich was arguing is that Māori tactics in this war depended on the Europeans attacking these really well-built pa that they, you know, would just throw themselves up against it and the relatively small numbers of warriors could fight off very large numbers of troops, which happened time and time again. And his argument was that cannibalism was part of this because the British forces were so outraged by it that they were like, well, we've got to go in there, we've got to put a stop to this, and they kept throwing themselves up against these pars. I mean, do you think there's any truth to that? If there is, then it certainly worked. Yeah. I'll put it that way. The exact reason for cannibalism in the Taranaki Wars is disputed. Some historians argue it was driven by religion and culture rather than tactics, and it's also clear that lots of Taranaki Māori didn't take part in it. Bent himself said there were several Māori who refused to eat human flesh when it was offered to them, including Titokawaru. After the defeat at Tunutu o Te Manu, there was another assault at a pa called Moturoa, which also ended in disaster for the government forces. Another 60 or so soldiers were killed or injured with only a handful of ho-ho casualties. Again, Bent says he saw some of the dead soldiers cooked and eaten after the battle. The final chapter of Te Tokawaru's war was at a pa called Tauranga Ika, and the plan of the European forces was pretty much the same tactic which had failed in all the other assaults. That was the third pa that was constructed with Bent's help, uh, Tauranga Ika. Uh, apparently Whitmore, who was head of the colonial forces, uh, he arrived soon after it was completed in February of 1869, and he attacked the power with artillery. He had Armstrong guns. But the, the weapon pits that uh, uh, they designed, which I think Bent was uh, helped with the making of, they, oddly enough, had sheets of tin. And those sheets of tin, I'm not sure where they got them from. They must have got them from sort of farmhouses, roofs or something. And they built these pet, these great big thick logs and, uh, and metal and earth. And consequently, they were... The reinforcing of them kept Bent and his fellow uh, combatants quite safe. It looked like this was going to be another bloody slaughter for the British, throwing themselves against the entrenched Māori forces. But when they finally did storm the pa the next day, they found nothing. Unbeknownst to the British, obviously, the fate of the pa really had already been decided because Titokaru's had uh, been quite indiscreet having found time during the construction of the fortification to have an affair with another chief's wife. Now, because this behaviour, and according to tradition, um, Titokuru had lost his manatapu, uh, and as an uh, ariki, a war leader, uh, the elders held a meeting to discuss this infidelity during this uh, attack, uh, and there was many, many angry speeches uh, that were given demanding his death over this breach of trust. Uh, But apparently a chieftainess stood up in his defence telling the gathering that uh, he shouldn't forfeit his life for one mistake and yes, he had lost his manatapu and they could no longer support him so the tribes should return to their various kaiangas and her suggestion was met with approval and the warriors and the family slipped away out the back into the forest. So when um, Whitmore and his friends eventually attacked in the morning, there was... Nothing there. They were they had been abandoned. This story of an affair is what Bent says happened, and it's sort of the generally accepted version of events from mainstream historians. But some of Titokawaru's descendants, one of them is Daisy Noble, don't accept that's all there was to it. We don't believe that it's about a woman at all. Because, you know, you're talking about our people who could take 
many wives if they wished. If there's one thing that man treasures above all else in Māoridom is land, woman and children. They are the three things that we cherish above all. We make sure to protect those absolutely. So as a reason why Titoko walked away because he'd lost the mana, because he had taken another wife's, another chief's wife, to us is not a reason for him to walk away. There has to be something far more deeper than that for him to walk and leave his people. And we don't, we, to this day, we still don't know what it is. Whatever the cause, this was the end of Titokawari's war. But it wasn't the end of Kimball Bent's story. There was still a price on his head and the heads of the Māori he was living among. And when I say their heads, I mean that literally. Whitmore had introduced a bounty for each ho-ho head brought to his tent. He uh, had to stop the practice in the end when these heads started to uh, just unceremoniously be dumped with a sackful into his tent. And he, I mean, they just were killing everybody. But apparently Whitmore paid each man his due, then withdrew the bounty because uh, the strategy had proved effective, but he... Uh, was pretty sure that the uh, the notion of a government-sanctioned decapitations would not win him much praise from his superiors. Yeah, it's sort of hard to maintain the moral high ground over the sort of, you know, exactly. cannibal but... ho-ho if you're headhunting. Yes, yes, because that's kind of the same thing. Kimball Bent continued living among Māori for a long time after the Battle of Tauranga Ika. It wasn't until 1878 that wider New Zealand heard directly from him. That year, he wrote to a government official he seems to have met while living among Māori in Pātia. It was reprinted in the Pātia Mail with a note pointing out that Kimball seemed to have lost his ability to write clearly in English while he had been living among Māori for so long. Here's an extract from that letter. I've edited it a bit to make it understandable. I know in my own mind that the white people do say that when the natives was in fighting, I would go and fight with them at at the white men. Thanks be to God during that time that I would have been with the natives, I never have lifted up a weapon in my hand against the white men. I will be very thankful to you if you would inquire if there would be danger for me to go among the white men in this country. Please write to me. So you can see from that letter that even a decade after the wars in Taranaki ended, Bent was still afraid to approach fellow Europeans. The letter also shows that even into the 1880s, there were plenty of Māori living totally separate from Pākehā society. Several journalists visited Bent and interviewed him about his life, and that seems to have made him feel safe enough to make at least a partial re-entry to European society. He worked as a carpenter in a sort of a a bushman, and he used to make um, shepherd's huts and what have you. And uh, from what people gathered, his English wasn't very good. And, and I think even when Cohen started to interview him in the beginning, his English was quite halting. And I think that's why Cohen might have, the way he wrote it, looks like he sort of helped bent along with the, with the way that he'd um, recorded what he was saying. And it's interesting, this sort of um, interaction with him and James Cowan, because this is sort of the rehabilitation of Kimball Bent, isn't it? Because he goes from being sort of this reviled traitor in European eyes Mm -hmm. to becoming almost a sort of novelty of, you know, times gone by. Well, yes, he became a curiosity. People quite often used to say, oh, there's that old crazy guy who lived with the Maoris and that sort of thing, and... uh, you know, he, he he visited Cohen two or three times, and he had his photograph taken. So he must have he must have sort of become more than a curiosity. And I think that Cohen, who's a really interesting guy himself, I mean, he came from East Tamaki and he spoke Maori fluently from an early age, and he he would have uh, been able to speak to Bent in Maori. And he eventually, as you say, you found the death certificate. He he died in Blenheim. He did. He died in Blenheim. And uh, when I found it, it was like I'd read all the stuff. Do you know, I'd found letters to the paper from disgruntled members of his regiment saying that he was a traitor and he should still be, uh, you know, made to account. And he basically 
um, was was a sci- uh, he was a cipher. I couldn't quite get a handle on him. And then when I found this, I went to the New Plymouth uh, Pukiariki and I found his death certificate. And suddenly there, he was a real person. He was an actual, there was a date, there was a place where he'd died. Because everything else, as I said, in the early part of his life, I couldn't find a thing. And there he was, he was a real person. Very special thanks to Daisy Noble and Chris Grosh. Chris's graphic novel is Kimball Bent Malcontent. Remember to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend about Black Sheep. To be honest, that's the biggest thing you could do to help me out. Also, remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode of this show. You can do that via RNZ's app or whatever other podcasting app you enjoy using. Personally, I'm a big fan of Radio Public. Also, go try out RNZ's other great podcasts. One cool one I haven't recommended before is The House, which takes a deep dive into all of the weird and wonderful and sometimes not so wonderful things which happen in the Houses of Parliament. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin and our sound engineer was Elliot Childs. This week our voice actors were Jim Moriarty, Brandon Mickle, Duncan Smith and William Saunders. Hi Icons, it's Danny Pellegrino from the pop culture podcast Everything Iconic and I love Nordstrom. No place better to shop, particularly during the holiday season, because they have everything. They have holiday decor at Nordstrom. They have cozy cardigans from Barefoot Dreams, my fave. They have cold weather attire, party attire, plus free shipping and free returns, free store pickup. You can also purchase a recycled fabric gift bag so your item arrives festive and wrapped. So check out Nordstrom this holiday season, a one-stop shop. You can explore more at Nordstrom in-store or online at Nordstrom.com.